You're watching Zvezda. This is Combat Approved. This episode, we begin once again with the story of the Su-57. And even though this is just a scale model, it is the model of Russia's most advanced fighter jet. On Combat Approved, we've talked a lot already about this and other Su aircraft. Today, we'll be talking about the design bureau behind this air power, the DB responsible for developing more than 100 aircraft and their variants, the manufacturer with 11,000 planes serially produced, and more than half of all Russian Air Force displaying Su on their wings. The secret to this success is not in the high reputation of its founding father, who is now long gone, nor is it luck that the DBs managed to preserve and grow its engineering prowess. It isn't even state contracts and support. It is the people who work here, the people who understand change and are prepared to move with the times. They have been making a valuable product the country always needed for a very long and difficult 80 years. So this year, the Sukhoi DB is deservedly celebrating its 80th anniversary. Super strong, super fast, super capable, with a rich record of super inventions. First Soviet ejector seat, drogue parachute, ski undercarriage, fly-by-wire system, titanium fuselage, variable sweep wing, forward sweep wing, stealth technology. All of this by Sukhoi. So what's the DB doing now? And what's in store for the future? The fifth-gen fighter, the Su-57, a pinnacle of modern aircraft design, is also the work of Sukhoi. With this milestone already behind them, it's time to fly forward. Combat Approved. There's a joke in aviation that losing airspeed is worse than losing a wife. Your lift in flight is generated by air flowing past the wing, so you can't let your speed fall too much, or the aircraft will stall and nosedive. What better way to describe the Sukhoi DB? From the very first day, the company moved only forward, tirelessly, fearlessly, innovatively. Like in the air, to stop is to die and so the innovations kept coming. The Sukhoi Su-57 is a fifth-gen fighter, the DB's latest burst forward, but not its last. We're even lower now, 300 feet lower at just 1,000 feet. They'll now try and pass below us again. This was shot in Oktubinsk, on the ramp of a cargo plane open mid-flight. And right below us, Russia's most advanced and arguably her most beautiful fighters in an aerial ballet. But which Sukhoi aircraft might have been in their place some eight decades ago? This is the Su-2, the first aircraft by the Sukhoi DB. Commissioned in 1939, it predated the war. In total, more than 800 of these planes were built. We'll return to this landmark Sukhoi aircraft later. But for right now, there's one very curious detail about it. The fact that many features of this first design were inherited by the Su-57, the latest flagship aircraft. Well, it so happened that the aircraft was originally commissioned and designed to have an all-metal structure. But before it went into production, the decision was made to substitute the metal in the fuselage for wood. So the aircraft became of mixed construction with both metal and wood components. This final design was approved for production, and it was these planes that saw combat in the Great Patriotic War. The Su-2, short-range light bomber, reconnaissance, and attack aircraft, 
Pavel Sukhoi won the development contract for the aircraft over the more established Tupolev and Polikarpov Bureau. But what can this archaic, by today's standards, machine have in common with the cutting-edge Su-57? Well, to start with, the Su-2 was originally planned to have an internal bomb bay with bombs suspended inside the fuselage to improve its speed characteristics. This idea was realized 70 years later in the 5th Gen fighter. And secondly, the Su-2 was also developed in utmost secrecy. Even some of the pilots didn't know about the plane. There's an anecdote in several memoirs about Pokrishkin's first dogfight during the Great Patriotic War. When he shot down a Su-2, piloted, as he was to learn later, by future hero of the Soviet Union, the famous Ivan Pstigo. But how could this friendly fire incident have happened? The plane wasn't yet well known. That's why Pokrishkin didn't recognize its silhouette. And it was only after the plane went down that he saw the red stars on its wings. Obviously, the powerhouse at the Sukhoi DB was Pavel Osipovich Sukhoi himself. Here's his photo taken before the revolution. Sukhoi was born in 1895, and here in this office he worked in 1953 to 1975. His colleagues still talk about how he would regularly hold his meetings here, always, until his very death. Personally involved in every step of designing the latest aircraft. Much of it here has been left untouched, his glasses to one side, his pen and pencil for making notes on new design projects to the other. But most significantly, look at the number of these projects, files upon files, then the future of aviation. Today, it's present. I think he was a very good teacher. He didn't just stuff his students' heads with facts. He gave them opportunities to grow on their own and to unleash their full potential. They say that Pavel Sukhoi in person was a bit stern and very meticulous about his work, expecting the same from his staff. He became head of his own DB in 1939, with several other attack aircraft to follow the Su-2. But then, in 1949, reminiscent of the Pokrishkin incident, another unexpected blow. The DB was shut down. It's hard to believe that when you look at the bustling DB today, but it was thought then that with the war over and agricultural sector a priority, warplanes had had their day. Some might still think this today, but time has settled this debate. In 1953, the Sukhoi DB was reopened, and today Sukhoi is more than just a DB. There are also several test sites near Moscow and two aircraft plants, in Novosibirsk and on the other side of the country in Komsomolsk on Amor. And right now, we'll video call them from here in Moscow. Well, the first question is how to place the Longeron in the 3D printer build chamber. We initially plan to do it vertically. We're talking about the Longeron in the Flapperon, which is an aerodynamic control surface on the trailing edge of a wing. We're currently making it the traditional way, welded titanium structure. It might not be immediately clear to a casual viewer what these pros are talking about, but if you try to puzzle it out, it becomes apparent that this is nothing short of a revolution in aircraft manufacturing. It used to be that in order to make a component, you had to machine it, or weld or rivet it together, or mold it. But in future, all of these could be superseded by 3D printing. It's called additive manufacturing, and it enables us to make, for example, components like this one. These could not be molded or welded or milled. The main thing now is to reach the required structural integrity parameters. After all, these components will have to withstand the supersonic stresses. But in the early 1950s, the pace of life was only starting to accelerate. Planes first reach Mach 1, more than 750 miles per hour, then move beyond it. And so it becomes clear we are entering a new supersonic era. This is the Su-7B, one of the variants of the Su-7. It was our first product after the DB's reinstatement, and the design proved so successful that during the very first test flight, the aircraft exceeded requirement specifications, reaching max speed of over 1,200 miles per hour 
and max altitude of over 65,000 feet. The Su-7B is classic Sukhoi. The modest, successful design is in fact almost 30 years in service, with nine variants developed in nine countries ordering the aircraft. This was our first international export. So out of approximately 2,000 Su-7s built in total, including all variants, about 400 were built for export. This was our breakthrough, the first step for Sukhoi as an international player. Another feather in Sukhoi's cap, the successor to the Su-7B, the Su-17, the first Soviet aircraft to feature a variable sweep wing design. Why variable sweep? Well, because at subsonic speeds, the best design is this, with straight wings spread wide. But the higher the speed, the more efficient the swept design. Reminiscent of birds folding their wings to speed up, isn't it? Well, aviation has always been inspired by nature, and the similarities will only grow stronger with time. Here's another example. This is the structure of the wing today, and that's a design suggested by computers. Looks very similar to tree roots, doesn't it? Yes, it's like roots or branches. This is what computers suggest, how it distributes the materials. There's another term to remember with this manufacturing revolution, topology optimization. It's when computers help design new layouts. A simple illustration, two components. First, designed by human and then CNC machined. Second, designed by computer and 3D printed. The slightly alien shape aside, the weight difference is key. The computer variant is 30% lighter, which translates to less metal expended at the same levels of structural rigidity. This is what topology optimization brings. Computers are indifferent to straight lines or geometrically pleasing shapes. They calculate and design aiming at better, lighter, stronger layouts. The most optimal layouts. That's why all these curved lines resembling tree roots and skeletal structures. You might be wondering, how can computers know the most optimal way? The answer is maths and Sukhoi databases. This place is the Sukhoi DB Static Testing Laboratory. This is where they stress test potential aircraft materials for structural robustness. The famous Sopramat, or strength of materials, a science about strength and resistance of structures and mechanisms. Every detail of future aircraft design has to survive being loaded in compression, tension, and torsion here. More than that, even the fuselage and the wings are tested here to breaking point. This helps establish the limits of their structural strength and generates a huge volume of data used by designers to optimize the shape and structure of components. With topology optimization, it's possible to design not only mechanisms and components, but the whole airframe structure, as shown in this 3D model. Here we can see the main load-bearing components of the airframe. And using this 3D model, we were able to recreate it in this physical scale model with the help of 3D printing. So, it seems that if only additive manufacturing and topology optimization had been in use some 20 years ago, the airframe structure of the Su-57 could have been looking like that. Right now, though, these technologies are already employed in the R&D stages for all future aircraft. And there lies one of Sukhoi's core principles. Always think ahead and go where no one has gone before. This was the story with the T-4. With its unusual shape and dimensions and unfamiliar naming scheme, it's not easy to guess that it too was designed by the Sukhoi DB. The T-4 was built to counter carrier battle groups on maritime theaters of operations, that is, aircraft carriers. It was designed to carry anti-ship air-to-surface missiles. In the post-war era, aircraft carriers became the U.S. Navy's main weapon. To counter them, the USSR needed a supersonic missile carrier bomber, a large plane, 
not exactly the Sukhoi's type. They say that Andrei Tupolev, another patriarch of Soviet aircraft design, questioned Sukhoi's ability to switch from designing small and agile fighters to large and powerful missile carrier bombers. Tupolev was saying that he knew his student Sukhoi and that this task was beyond him. And Sukhoi was saying, I am your student, I'll find the solution. Statistics tells us that new aircraft designs rarely reach 30% originality. The T-4 built in 1971 was as high as 90% new design. Well, the first thing was the airframe, built primarily from titanium and steel to withstand high temperatures. The second was the fly-by-wire system. It was one of the first planes in the world to have it. And the third was the hydraulics pressure increase to 4,000 psi. Today, the fly-by-wire system is used on all aircraft, but at the time, it was a serious breakthrough. The T-4 was also the first Soviet aircraft to have the auto-throttle system, fuel turbopump, and droop nose. This mechanism would later find application in the design of the Tu-144 supersonic airliner. So where are we now? In the Supercomputer Technologies Research Center. And what does it mean, Supercomputer Technologies? Well, it means that here we develop and program cutting-edge digital doubles for our most promising aircraft designs. Such as? Such as the Su-57, for example. In early 1970s, Pavel Sukhoi contacts Dorodnitsyn Computing Center of the USSR Academy of Sciences, his request to help automate aircraft design process. The scientists are surprised. None of the heads of the leading DBs have thought to ask that. From the drawing board to computers, from designing parts to modeling situations, Pavel Sukhoi seemed to have a unique insight into the distant future of designing. He saw half a century ago precisely where the industry was moving. This is the simulation of the drop tank jettison. We see the stress distribution simulation which allows us to account for the interaction with the hard point and make conclusions about the safety of such jettison. Wait, but aren't we just ejecting, dropping this external tank? Why would we need to calculate, simulate all this? There are situations where there's some probability of impact with the aircraft. We must be sure that the jettison is safe. Ground test everything in your power is today one of the guiding principles of aircraft designers. In the past, every part of the aircraft had to be first designed on paper, then machined, then tested, redesigned with received data, machined again, and tested again. Today, we can identify most of the design flaws like this on computer screen. This is a simulation of extreme flight conditions. You see the temperature. The nose is overheating and the canopy. Relatively overheating, yes. The main parameters we're simulating are the aerodynamics. And what does that show us? It shows us the stress distribution. So we can see the points of critical load on the skin, for example, or the windshield. This doesn't mean that we no longer need physical stress tests, but today they are conducted only after the digital ones are completed. Another thing I've noticed is that you have a lot of young members in your team. The youngest here is how old? The youngest are about 20. Students. And you trust them with these difficult tasks. We are working with students to ensure that they have the theoretical and practical knowledge to solve these difficult problems in the future. I've always wanted to find out what pilots today think about these planes, and we'll be able to do that right now with Sergei Bogdan, hero of Russia and test pilot of the Su-57, and one of the legendary Sukhoi aircraft, the Su-15.
What always differentiated Sukhoi planes is the cockpit room. Pilots coming from other planes always said, yeah, there's lots of shoulder room, lots of foot space, lots of space everywhere. It's great. The principal difference between the old ones and the new is that aircraft today are not just tools. They are active participants, companions in the air. I mean, those planes are just so competent. You can easily make them do a loop at 300 or at some very high, even supersonic speed, and they'll do it. With these ones here, they're very restricted. The altitudes are limited. You go for a loop a bit higher and the plane starts struggling with power. You won't reach the top at the speed you need, starts dropping it. With speeds, it's the same. A bit higher or lower and the handling at the top starts to falter. But modern planes, they have excellent aerodynamics, brilliant computer systems. So it's basically computers doing half the work handling the control surfaces. Here's an illustration of that. Voyanaya Priyomka reporter Boris Zeman, first time ever attempting to take off in the 5th Gen Su-57. Rolling. On a simulator, of course. Gear up? Yes. Just think about it. First time ever behind the stick of a fighter and taking off with ease. And no wonder, even the interface is intuitive, resembling modern smartphones and tablets. This is a standard instrument layout. On the left is the MFD with the tactical situation, and on the right, the MFD with the flight data. Even if the pilot makes a mistake, the computer corrects it. There are also the autopilot controls, weapon control system, target acquisition system. What's next for these technologies? We are currently working on developing MFDs with a touch interface. Dynamic voice control systems with context awareness. Three D indicator systems for monitoring pilots' brain activity. All of this is still in the future, but even now the Sukhoi DB is doing more than just designing and building military aircraft. Some may be surprised to learn that seven times world aerobatic champion Svetlana Kapanina is a flight instructor at the Sukhoi DB. And Yuri Vashtuk, the president of the Federation of Aeromodeling of Russia, is a test pilot at the Sukhoi, flying the Su-57. By the way, the model aircraft we showed at the start of the episode is a work of his fellow members of the Federation. Watching her take flight is no less fascinating than watching her full-scale sister, the Su-57. It almost seems she doesn't need any runway. Take off, and an immediate 90 degrees bank. Straight to an inclined Immelman. Not a basic aerobatic maneuver. And now for an advanced maneuver, the famous Pugachev's Cobra. Aside from aviation, the DBs had several cutting-edge non-military projects as well. For our colleague Boris Zeman, a physician by training, this story is a very personal one. I was a teenager, and I remember my father was doing first artificial heart transplants. So we used to have lots of different types of these artificial hearts in the house. And I was astonished to learn later that those very first hearts my father worked with had been designed and manufactured here at the Sukhoi DB. The program was overseen by the DB and by another higher body. We had a directive, a very strict directive, because the project was international. I reported to Pavel Osipovich Sukhoi, but I also made monthly reports on our progress before the Health Ministry Board. Innovating is a bit of a coin toss. You never know what you're going to get until you make it. You win or you lose. 
But without trying, there can be no winning. In the early 1990s, the Sukhoi management decided to go all-in to make the most unconventional aircraft in the country's history. The Su-47 Burkut. Its chief designer was Mikhail Pogosyan, who later became the CEO of the Sukhoi DB. But how would they design and build and test this new aircraft with the country in deep crisis? The answer was, they'd do it on their own, with their own money. The project helped preserve the company, gave them a goal to reach for, and the goals were, as always, ambitious. To design a three-surface aircraft with forward-swept central wing. The design of this aircraft is striking even today. I was ready for how the plane looked long before I saw it. I saw the design papers, then I saw it in the assembly shop, so I was slowly getting used to it. But still, that exterior design was, of course, something else. Money was short then, so they decided to flight test the prototype they already built for stress testing. Today it is in a museum exhibit. Well, Burkut was a testing ground for many ideas. Not just the forward-swept wing. And it's true that the Su-57 is in some ways its successor. But of course, the forward-swept wing, which proved its merits in full, was expensive and difficult to build. The forward-swept wing helps improve the handling at lower speeds and also allows for lower takeoff and landing speeds. The design feature was deliberate because Burkut was intended as a carrier-based fighter. The drawback of the design is a massive increase in wingtip loads. That's why these parts were largely made from strong composite materials, which helped later successfully implement them in the design of the new Su-57. This continuity and innovation is why, I think, Sukhoi, in its 80th year, remains a leader in the industry. Here's another example of Sukhoi's innovative spirit, knowledge management system. Over the years, the DB has accumulated so much data that they decided to make something like an internal social net, exclusive to the Sukhoi staff. This is the main page of our knowledge management system where you see all the links to the sections on various aspects of company business. There's also a search engine similar to Yandex, which can help find necessary information. The KMS includes a search engine, an internal chat room, interest groups, databases, a kind of Sukhoi internet, an indispensable tool for any designer, a tool for creating new aircraft, or for modernizing existing ones, for example, the Su-25. This subsonic attack aircraft made its maiden flight way back in 1975. But what's 40 years of service for a Sukhoi aircraft? Some will be surprised that the seemingly outdated Su-25 is up for modernization not up for modernization, it's being modified already. All aircraft in service are given new tech, better defensive and offensive capabilities with digital equipment. The structure or the exterior will not be changed. But don't you think it might be time to out with the old? Not at all. Never rush with these sweeping gestures. First build a replacement, then decide. Besides, this plane has seen more combat than most modern aircraft. Since its deployment in 1981, it has been used in the Soviet-Afghan War, Iran-Iraq War, Tajik Civil War, Gulf War, War in Abkhazia, First Nagorno-Karabakh War, and many other conflicts. And it would not have survived to this day if it hadn't proved time and time again its formidable capabilities. Combat approved was able to film the Su-25 in combat in the Syrian Arab Republic. 
We were allowed to mount action cameras on aircraft and flight helmets and show how this search and destroy mission against the terrorists was carried out. This aircraft is unique due to its high combat survivability, as shown during its first missions in the Afghan war. With 60,000 missions flown in total, only 28 aircraft have been lost, more than 2,000 missions for every lost aircraft. I can't think of any other plane with such a strong record. A set of measures was taken at the design stage to achieve this high combat survivability. Increased armor plating, blast proofing, redundant control mechanisms, and so on. One time, the Mujahideen managed to hit one of the engines on this aircraft, but it just carried on with the mission. During the Russo-Georgian War in 2008, an aircraft was hit even worse, with both engines damaged, but still it managed to return to the base. Such is the story of the development and service of the Su-25. Meanwhile, Sukhoi was already launching its next project, the aircraft that would become the primary workhorse of the country's air force, the Su-27, an all-weather supersonic multi-role heavy fighter truly an aircraft for any combat scenario. The Su-27 has been called pivotal, historic, groundbreaking. What's special about it? Its aerodynamics make it supremely maneuverable, which is, of course, the result of the design decisions. I mean, the shape of the wings and the airframe the lifting body design. This is a formation flight of Russia's two most famous aerobatic teams, the Strigi or the Swifts, and the Ruski Vityazi, or the Russian Knights. The Swifts are piloting the MiGs, and the Knights, the heavy Su-27s. But both teams are in a single formation, performing aerobatics in unison, meters apart. Worth noting, that where teams elsewhere would be trying to make it easier for themselves by stripping the aircraft and making it lighter, the Russian Knights have often performed with the aircraft in active service, with full equipment. About 37 years had passed between its first flight and the introduction of a next-gen fighter. There were, of course, aircraft of the transitionary 4-plus and 4-plus-plus generations. But just think, it's almost like two generations of people have changed since grandchildren are born and with them come these new gen fighters. This is a historic aircraft and it still has a huge potential for modernization. That's why they are being modernized, fitted with more modern systems, improved. The Su-27 paved the way for the Su-30 MKI, the world's first heavy two-seater fighter built for the Indian Air Force. The design would be further developed into the Su-30SM variant, the aircraft famous for bringing in more export money than any other weapon system. Then came the next big step for the Sukhoi DB, the Su-34, world's only tactical bomber capable of supersonic flight. And with a cockpit large enough for the pilot to actually get up and stretch mid-flight. Only in the cockpit of the Su-34 can the pilot, in the middle of a flight, just get up, do some squats, stretch his legs and arms and back. And of course, the Su-27 is one of the precursors to our pride and joy, the Su-57. The aircraft are already on their way to active service. Sukhoi have received a massive contract from the armed forces for 76 Su-57s, so we've asked the Sukhoi leadership about what comes next in, say, half a century. 
Well, I don't think anyone could tell you where the aircraft will be in 50 years. I haven't really thought about that. Because things change so quickly now, it might even be more than an aircraft. A spacecraft, perhaps. Going to space on an aircraft? Will we live to see the day? Well, let's ask the expert, the chief test pilot of the Sukhoi DB. Why not? We're always examining potential designs for the long term. Well, looking at the short term and on the web, Sukhoi seems to be about to stun the world. We've just witnessed the maiden flight of the cutting-edge combat drone Okotnik, with its flying wing design almost undetectable with radar. It made several passes over the airfield and successfully landed. I can share that the Sukhoi DB is currently working on several next-generation projects. Our projects are not limited to modifying the well-known and proven in combat, in Syria for example, aircraft deployed with Russian and other armed forces, but also include next-generation programs for the Ministry of Defense. I hope we'll soon be able to announce some very interesting upcoming events. But since we're talking about Sukhoi, the Sukhoi traditions and school of design, we value modesty. As Pavel Sukhoi did himself, so I won't say too much. We'll show what we mean to show to the world at the MAX 2019. But for now, watch the media space. Well, I understand the modesty, but could you maybe give us a little hint? Is it going to be something new and groundbreaking as the Su-57? Well, any new revolutionary product is based on the existing technology. So we're of course using the potential of new solutions found during the development of the Su-57. I think the trends are clear. The use of AI, new types of weapon systems, these are the avenues we're exploring. And that was just us talking immediate plans. The revolutionary in the head of the DB's vocabulary is telling. For the Sukhoi DB, revolutionizing aircraft design has become a way of life. For here, as in the air, to stop is to die, and to look decades ahead is to win.